another episode of Friends of MariaDB. I'm uh, Kai Harner, CEO of the MariaDB Foundation, and this is the December 2021 edition of the server Minifest. And with me here, I have Eric Kurman, our chair, I have Monty, our founder, and I have Vicenzo Turbaro. How would you present yourself? So I am Vicenzo Turbaro and I am a team lead software developer at MariaDB Foundation. So what we will do is we will watch the same videos as you and then we will press stop and come with a com number of comments about this and ho I hope the comments will be relevant for you as well. Let's start. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Daniel Black. I'm here with uh, Rick James, who's been a, a long time uh, MySQL helper on uh, Stack Overflow and DB Stack Exchange and has been around for quite a while. Uh, Semi retired now, but um, has previously worked for Yahoo, um, where he developed lots of skills in hitting it, solving problems. Probably should have rehearsed that more. <laughs> cool. So, Rick, I've invited you today to um, talk about your experience and, and what you see is sort of happening in the, the user community and um, how MariaDB is, is helping or not helping, as the case may be, um, users' needs. So I um, want to sort of talk about, I, I mean, we've seen over the years um, numerous uh, users on uh, DBA Exchange and Stack Exchange getting in trouble. So what are the, the normal beginner SQL user troubles that happen? Well, the beginners tend to not necessarily even know what an index is. Once we get past that hurdle, which of course is pretty basic, uh, then they start indexing every column, which <laughs> is a waste. And they haven't discovered composite indexes. That's where you have two columns, and that helps with certain types of queries. And then they, um, they think they know all about indices, and they say, why is it this query using my index? And then it gets into details of why it might not use an index, simply because it would be more efficient not to bother with the index. You're, you're going to look at most of the rows anyway. Um, they don't necessarily put a primary key on every table, and that's sort of a no-no, especially with NODB. They sometimes don't realize that the primary key is unique and it is an index. So they add another index or another unique on the same column. Minor waste, not nothing serious. Sometimes they ask, well, Shouldn't this be a hash index? Why, why is it just B trees? Well, B trees are as good as hashes, and they are even better in some situations. Yeah, you're right, please. Yeah. Okay, so Rick is totally right regarding hash index. They are really good in memory, but usually really, really poor in disk. Uh, and uh, the organization of dynamic hashing is really, really bad at this. Um, they look at the CPU and say, oh my goodness, uh, the CPU is pegged. What's going on? It's usually a poor query that needs either a better index or maybe rewriting the query to do it a different way. Um, <clears throat> they uh, reach for buying new hardware. And if I get hold of them, I say, no, no, let's try to uh, speed up the program, speed up the queries. And usually there is a way to speed up the queries. I rarely see a production system with, uh, certainly not with all CPUs running full tilt. Often it's less than one CPU's worth and it's doing just fine and doing as much as they want. So uh, as Rick points, uh, pointed out is that uh, uh, you should see if you get the performance issue, what's the problem, is it disk or CPU? If your disk is, CPU is not running at full speed, there's usually ways to tune, tune things. No, and, and I think the uh, larger thing he was indicating there was that uh, immediately reaching for new hardware is seldom going to be as good of an answer as first investigating 
what is the cause and looking for your bottlenecks and find out uh, if you can address it, not with new hardware, but simply by writing the query in a different way. And I've run into that plenty of times because the first way we write the query is just to get the job done. And we may not even revisit that query for years until we, our data has expanded enough that now the poor performance of that query is starting to be visible in our application. And that's, that's a great time to then look at what query we're actually generating and see if we can generate it differently. Oh, and a, and a great way to find, figure out which queries are slow is to enable the slow query log. Slow query log, yeah. Have a look. Usually fixing the top 10 there will make your site, website go just much faster. I'm pretty sure that Rick will comment on that soon. Uh, I guess the, the way uh, a lot of um, queries are framed is like, help me tune my way out of this problem <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, as well. The, uh, the Finding the worst query, you, you need to fi use the slow log. That's one way to do it, unless you can analyze the program otherwise. And the slow log, which uh, especially like the PT Query Digest for summarizing what you can get from the slow log. It essentially points to the worst query and the next few bad ones. And sometimes uh, fixing that will fix all of your CPU problems. Okay. I had one example of a, um, a machine that was pegged at 100% CPU. I found the slow log, found that there was a uh, simple uh, query that was asking, is the date uh, equal to this? And it had date of the column equal to a constant. So the couldn't use the index on the date column. In other words, it wasn't sargeable. S-A-R-G-A-B-L-E. That's a word that I learned over the time uh, that discusses why, uh, wh what kinds of queries, what kinds of where clauses do not use indices because you've got an indexed column hiding inside a function. Okay. This is a common mistake by many people. Okay. So if we go back to, you know, what should, you know, beginner users do to um, uh, prepare themselves for, for writing in SQL? Well, most people don't really do much or, for that matter, need much. I mean, they, they, they can uh, pretty quickly learn what a select looks like and write one. The, one of the hurdles to get past is not programming procedure-wise. In most languages, you do step, 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 but with SQL, you're doing, you're applying some action to an entire table of rows. Uh, SQL can do that quite efficiently. Learning to do that makes things a lot faster and less code to write. Yeah. And, and people getting over the hurdle of, oh, okay, I'll just write a loop and then do SQL inside of loop. Um, I Loops, guess the cursors, other those things are, are essentially no-nos. Yep. Uh, okay, so it's just tend to be slow. So, so it's just I, I guess users on, on their the SQL journey is um, hitting a problem and just getting over it in a, a rather predefined way. Cool. And my okay. um, is very easy to, to get started with, so um, you can do it yourself on that. your own machine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess the intermediate users and, and, you know, what happens after a while that, you know, a user has got a, a, a well-defined running thing and then it just starts to fall off. What are the, the normal signs that, you know, something's starting to go wrong and what are the um, typical fixes? The typical sign is that your web page or whatever you're doing uh, takes several seconds to come up. And what I would do at that point is look at the queries and see what they're doing. 
Um, of course, it could be non SQL code that's taking forever to bring up the web page. But that's a matter of digging through the code to see what it is that's taking the time. Okay. So one of the things that people often get wrong, especially when they're using an ORM, is that they accidentally do, instead of one query to get all the data, they do um, multiple queries, like for a for loop that, let's say it looks through a, a user object, and that user object, every time you query a member, you hit the database. And you, this way you end up having, let's say, 100 queries to just load a single web page. And that will not show up in the query log, the slow query log, because the queries are fast. Mm -hmm. It's just that there's so many of them, and you're paying the round trip between the application and the database layer. So that's one of the key areas I have found that people get wrong. And it's rather easy to get it wrong and not know that you've got, gotten it wrong. And, and so uh, I imagine that when you're helping someone through that, that the first thing you do is start to ask, what can we profile, how can we measure? Exactly. And one thing I like to do is I start up uh, my top and I just look at the QPS counter. And if I click on a page and I see the QPS just showed up, then that's definitely something we need to look at. Queries per seconds. Yep. Okay. Um, so it, it often, I guess, comes to back to something fairly basic like lack of an index, your data so size has grown. Um, some data, the data has, has grown. grown, different yep. query plans got used, may not be the right one. Yeah. OK. Yep. So it's yeah, showing the same sort of problems. A basic tool is explained to tell you what the query plan is, but unfortunately, it doesn't tell you what to do when it's not a good query plan. OK. And I don't have a good solution for that. Nowadays, you have optimizer trace that tells you the options that the optimizer has. <coughs> From there, you can see uh, why what's choose and why, and you can usually figure out why not. How do you turn it on? Just set the optimizer trace variable to on. There's documentation in the knowledge base. Should maybe the explain output sort of uh, go to a link to say, you know, solve this? <laughs> um. What I do at this point is I take a, an S, uh, a select statement and I can see what indexes are needed or how to rewrite it. I've gotten to that point, but it took me more than a decade. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> so keep with it and, and you'll, you'll be perfect at it. <laughs> yep, keep with it. Okay, that's a good start. Um, I had a, um, another presenter talking about uh, database. Um, oh, sorry. Let's start with um, DBAs and sysadmin and DevSops. Is do you see there actually an, a DevOps role, or, or do people try to keep in development or sysadmin? Since uh, MariaDB is simple enough a typical programmer can be the DBA, the sysadmin, everything all rolled in one. And when I was working for big companies, that was, I mean, th there was a clear divide between the programmer and the DBAs. And that was perhaps partially because places like Oracle essentially needed that. There was that much difference between writing code and maintaining the system. Uh, but with MariaDB, there's not that much uh, need for a DBA. So, Certainly when you get to, to a big uh, setup. So the continued focus on like ease of use and um, default tunings that are right um, have made it almost more accessible that way compared to Oracle? Well, one thing to note there is that the uh, the default settings of when you load this, uh, the database engine have been reasonably tuned. A decade ago, they were pretty bad, and certain things had to be fixed before you could get to square two. <laughs> now, uh, the defaults are mostly in good shape. 
I'm sure someone wants to comment here. I think there's room for improvement, but uh, but but indeed, I think it's important that we get the defaults right and continue to improve those and revisit those over time. The problem with the defaults is that most of our users are using desktop, and the defaults are for the desktop. Mm -hmm. So and that's uh, that makes it hard for have have a uh, really good defaults. So the plan is to within the next few releases is that uh, uh, we will have a, an auto setting, and then you just said auto. And auto means that. Uh, this whole computer is just for you. Mm -hmm. Just to use all, every, everything you can to get maximum performance. And that's the solve it. So, so uh, some self-tuning at runtime? No, self-tuning at setup time. At setup time, okay. For, for defaults. Okay. And it's only when you get into a serious programming with serious problems that you may need help saying, okay, how can I better tune this setup for this type of application? Okay. Yep. Um, so, you know, the, there's MySQL tuner that's been around for a while. Is there um, any other, you know, usual resolution mechanisms that um, uh, people should attempt or just ask? <laughs> Um, there aren't a lot that you can necessarily immediately learn to do yourself. Uh, I'll probably bring up a few as we go along. I haven't specifically isolated that. Getting the index right is the biggest thing for performance, and that's not trivial. Okay. So, yeah, getting expert help, um, you know, is a... Uh, Good time saver. <laughs> yep. It can be. Yep. Okay. Um, we've seen over you know the last ten years that database containers and Kubernetes is is taking off. Uh, how mature is this um, on the database side? The database is quite mature. The things around it. Well, for building web pages, for example, there are something like a hundred third-party pro products that try to abstract the database. And they irritate me in that now you have to learn the abstraction. And then when things go wrong, you have to learn SQL as well. So you're having to learn twice as much than if you just did it yourself. Okay, right. I would say abstractions are good if you don't know which data you will use because that actually hides the database. So you can easily move from one to the other one. But otherwise, I agree with Rick. <laughs> yeah, well, I, my, my notion is that, uh, that if you're using an object relational mapper, that, uh, that Rick is entirely right, that at some point you begin to, in order to tune that relational mapper, either start writing SQL directly or you have to really learn uh, the details of that ORM. And I think that the that many developers are um, hesitant to learn straight SQL, and, and so they end up going down the ORM tuning path. And that's a fine thing to gain mastery in as well, but really uh, uh, you will do yourself a great service uh, to gain some proficiency in writing the SQL directly. And the other extreme is the no SQL direction is you have to reinvent a SQL. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a bit, but oh, you need an I index? Okay, one. figure out how to write one. <laughs> I won't loosely define types, but now I've got to write all the type checking in the code. <laughs> ah, yes, yes. Yeah, type checking. Haven't done that in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, another common thing from there. Okay. Um, so um, on, I guess, an ecosystem point of view, there's, I guess, MariaDB provides, I guess, a server, but a lot of the tools that and and frameworks that people develop are, are outside of MariaDB and just occurring in their, their own way. Um, 
and you both, mentioned before uh, there's like some disconnect. Um, so what would your a view of, of a, an ideal ecosystem look like? An ideal ecosystem, a machine of my own. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Bracona toolkit is very handy. MariaDB has a bunch of tools too, and uh, some of them are at a price. Some of them come free. Um, I tend to use, for my own purposes, Apache, PHP, MySQL. Well, any flavor of MySQL, including MariaDB. Okay. So, I mean, I mean PHP, you know, ex exposes SQL pretty much in a, a raw form, which um, sort of saves you from, you know, jumping between the, the framework and the um, and, and SQL. Or do you use some kind of PHP um, ORM? Or I write helper? SQL. Yep. I, I, I don't have anybody generating SQL. 20 years yep. ago, I said, hmm, I'm doing a lot of uh, SQL in various um, flavors. I should write something, a front end to this. And then I looked at the details. Hmm, let's see, that has limit, that doesn't have limit. This has this syntax, that has that syntax. Forget it. <laughs> I better just write it myself. So if that comes back to it, the um, original um question before that you know maybe an ideal ecosystem is uh such that uh, a close eye is you know kept on um these orms and ensuring that they have all the the syntax and the features that the underlying server has As... uh, who's going to do all that work <laughs> there, there is that <laughs> well, i mean yeah. just recently with cte uh over new syntax totally different syntax how about the uh sequence table in uh, mariadb that i love give me a sequence of one to ten or can then convert that to dates how to get a table of dates i love that one but anyway <clears throat> yeah okay so yeah there's, there's a lot of gaps there <laughs> well yeah Glad you like that one. I, I like it too. I'll pass it on to Sergey. <laughs> yep. Okay. There are two kinds of sequences in uh, MariaDB. One is the one that Rick is talking about, that Jeff can generate the sequence of number between any two numbers. And then we have the uh, ANSI SQL sequence that allows you to uh, generate uh, um, numbers uh, incrementing for the previous use that could be used by another thread. For example, for uh, replacing auto increment uh, in for primary keys. So, um, what what do you see um, being developed in um, MariaDB to account for user needs in the near future? Is, is there account gaps for user needs? Hmm? Are user needs changing? Not a lot. Uh, there are still data warehouses at the big end. There are still WordPress-like things at, um, for blogging. Uh, there are still um, hmm. no. I, I don't. Huh. There's transaction. Sure, lots of transactional stuff. It's been amazingly stable for a large number of years, but the only difference is we're now talking terabytes instead of gigabytes. And before that, we were talking megabytes. Okay, so, so the, the scaling also means that, you know, we've got more storage and we've got slightly, um, you know, more processes kind of available as things go by too. Multiple cores is a waste. MariaDB yeah. does not need multiple cores. It Well, it needs a few, but not many. Uh, the typical machine has far more cores than you need, unless you've got some sloppy queries. Uh, with SSDs, uh, IO has suddenly become a lot better, a lot faster. Uh, 
things like sharding are still challenging and you're on your own for doing sharding. Um, but not many people do sharding. Uh, massive ingestion of uh, stuff like uh, I encounter people who are tracking a number of vehicles. Uh, sensors on vehicles send in information every 10 seconds or whatever. They're recording that in a database and then digesting it or something. Uh, Sensor-like stuff is always a big challenge. Uh, and it tends to be something that you can't do it your, do yourself. You need big machine, big thinking of how to do the, how to digest the data, et cetera. That's on the big end of things. There's still a lot of stuff on the little end. I mean, writing a blog, how difficult is that? <laughs> true, true. Remember, when you talk about digesting a data, that's something you can do in parallel on many machines. That's not really a problem. It's more about combining those and get those into some form that you can easily uh, process in real time for user queries. That's the challenge. Indeed. Yeah, I mean, the, we're the hard part is thinking what to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, you certainly, you know, write a, um, a few blogs and, and articles yourself. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Now, what I try to do is aim at uh, what you need to do, not what you can do. A reference manual says what you can do. But should I? Is that the best way to do it? Which way should I? Uh, blah, blah. So I try to say, okay, for this task, go that direction. Okay. Um, okay, in conclusion, um, do you what areas do you think MariaDB should um, improve? Um, there are, well, let me see, I have a list here of. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> <That's it. laughs> Lay it on. <laughs> uh, windowing, windowing functions need better performance. Um, There are, there's, people try to do, give me some, a, a few random rows. There's no clean way to do that. Groupwise max is another thing that is better done with some, to, some technique in the engine rather than kludgy ways by the user. Uh, <clears throat> a materialized view would help with uh, data warehousing. Analytics. You've yep. reached into some degree of uh, data typing, such as the UUID, uh, JSON. There's the possibility of IP addresses being a data type. There is. It's on yeah. Coinet 6. If it is. A, yeah. a lot of people want to turn a table sideways. Uh, True. That's doable, but it's tedious. And I think there is a standard syntax that does that. So what the heck? Trying to do it. Uh, the performance schema is there, but it's so gnarly that uh, it needs a better wrapper around it. That's true. But isn't sys, um, what's the name of it? Sys, sys, sys schema. Sys schema, isn't that a wrapper around? That's a little bit more manageable. It, it is a little bit more manageable. Um, I, I, I still have uh, a desire to see some improvement. Submit the pull request. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, did you, some sargeable test, like the one I mentioned with date, could be optimized in the optimizer rather than forcing the user to rewrite his query to get some speed. Yep. Uh, a lot of novices come in with, and use left join everywhere, not realizing they're really doing an inner join half the time. And when I try to read their code, okay, is this really a left join or not? So some detection of you're added a, a where clause on, on the right side. Yeah. So therefore it can just forget that left is there. 
I haven't looked to see if Explain Extended actually does that for us, but anyway. Yeah, uh, there's no optimization for OR. Practically none anyway. That OR is much less often used in a WHERE clause compared to AND, uh, but there's essentially no way for the engine to do the work. So um, when it comes to OR optimization, we do perfect OR optimizations when there are common stunts. Uh, but uh, we do, uh, currently we don't use if you say that uh, uh, field A is e equal to field B or A is equal to or C. That we don't do. But if everything constant, they work. I often tell people to turn it into a union, and that's a bit tricky. Yeah, comes a, a bit bloated. I guess with CTEs, that can be a little bit simpler, but it, it's... Well, the CTE no. itself is a bit complex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gets it down to a single reference, but whether it's optimized. Yeah. Okay. Cool. In fact, CTEs are pretty much just like a sub queries in the from class. There's no difference between them than the underlying implementation. No. But I think the, all of his uh, suggestions about things that could use work were legitimate. I think those are all things that, indeed, we could see some improvement. And I look back at his first comments and those are like the basic things we've been teaching in SQL classes from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So the one disagreement I have is or implicit disagreement of something implicit because uh, uh, SQL is actually not that hard to, uh, to learn. You can learn that in the most basic stuff including optimization in one or two days. So it's not like learning Perl or Python or C where that actually takes months. I, I, for, for basic usage, absolutely. It doesn't take long to, to get up and running with the basics of what you need. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And indexes are not that complex. In, I agree. The, the only yeah. thing that you have to read, read up on, and quick table, in which cases the index are used. Mm -hmm. and, and then you know 80% of the importance. Mm -hmm. well, okay. Well, um, thank you for your insights today, and um, much appreciate the interview. And yeah. Oh, have a good day. Enjoyed it. Good. So now, my friends went for a tea. Um, we need comments from somebody else for the next video. Uh, I think we'll go to the other side of the planet, to Australia, with uh, Daniel Black commenting the next one. So, welcome to this interview from the front lines with Oli Zenhauser, and welcome yourself, Oli. Hello, Kai. Nice to hear from you. Great. So, the plan is for the viewer to gain new insights on MariaDB Server, on how it's used, and learn from you, Oli. We're former colleagues from way back when, MySQL AB, and the idea for the header from the front lines came from a chat that you and I had earlier this week. Uh, you had military analogies. Is that because you're Swiss? Well, I, I didn't get. I had military. Uh, well, you had a military uh, background, a military analogy for the uh, header from the front lines. That's very belligerent. Is that because every Swiss person has a gun in the in the cupboard? Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. So it's similar. I don't know. We we are in the in the front. We are. We have direct contact with the customers. We, we are fighting for or with the customer. It depends a little bit. Um, we try to help them to solve something. Yeah, seriously, I think uh, that, that's a great analogy. So from Dual, for those in the, amongst the viewers who don't know, is a consulting and training company in Switzerland and Germany and the, the other places. And, and that does give some merit to the analogy. So you see how MariaDB server is being used and received in the front line, so to speak. And we at MariaDB Foundation don't always get the, the, the same exposure from, uh, from uh, far away from the front line. Yeah, possibly that's correct. So we are dealing day to day with the customer. And if we see something with the customer, if we see a problem, then we try to give it back to you. We open the tickets. 
that you right. can can fix them. Right, and, and, and now this is, I mean, uh, opening tickets about bugs is one thing, but I think there's a lot of soft knowledge that we don't get, and that's the purpose of this, this interview. So you can give some, add some color to us and also to the viewers. So the purpose for us, for, for the MariaDB Foundation, is to learn from you uh, how to go out about our business. And our business at the MariaDB Foundation is, is adoption, openness and continuity. So, so we're a non, not-for-profit organization and our idea, our goal is to increase the adoption of MariaDB server. We want to bless the world through more usage of it. And um, uh, openness means uh, accepting and nurturing the valuable contributions from our user base. And we're sometimes getting myopic ourselves. So that's why we need to listen to people from the, the front line like you. Okay. So then, so now we want to, to uh, know what you see in these front lines. Uh, you sent a, a URL today about your training classes. It says uh, MariaDB and MySQL in the same class. So do they still fit into one class? Um, we are currently in the situation that the ecosystem splits, but I would say both ecosystems are not good big enough yet to, to separate them completely. So let's say 90 to 95% of the course or training material is still the same. And then in the training, I say, okay, this topic is for MariaDB and this is only for MySQL and this is for MariaDB. So it's still okay. Uh, we have seen a trend in the last four years that let's say four years ago, nobody knew about MariaDB zero. And in the last four years, uh, this has completely shifted to, let's say, 75% of, uh, of, of the users or the customers is requiring MariaDB and 25% is, is using MySQL. So there was a shift from zero to 75%. That's, of course, great news for us. Uh, <laughs> sure. and, uh, but I would want to understand why. Uh, so, so why do you think that is? Where do they, these people listen? Well, so it's actually two questions. One is, why are, have they shifted? Uh, and the second one is, how have, have they learned about us? But let's take the first one first. So, so why do you think that is? Okay, uh, there are probably several reasons. Uh, one reason is uh, we make posts and advertising that we are a MariaDB training facility. And I'm not really aware of anybody else doing that in German speaking Europe. So maybe there are some. So that means we attract people using MariaDB and maybe MySQL users are going to MySQL itself or to other companies which are more focused on MySQL only. So that means uh, the bubble I am living in is maybe not a 100% accurate picture of the whole ecosystem because we attract a part of the ecosystem. So, right. that, so that, that's one reason. So, so one reason is, is that you are searching out the bubble that, that, that is more closer to Maria Nive. But do you see other reasons than that? Yeah, so we see a lot of customers, they are still having MySQL and want to move away. Uh, why are they doing that? Um, one thing is they, don't trust the company Oracle, where MySQL belongs today. Uh, don't trust Oracle anymore. As Oracle has done in the past a lot of evil things to the customers, so they don't trust them. We have some customers, they have a complete no Oracle policy anymore. So they have to search for alternatives. And the, the easiest alternative, and the alternative which is the the loudest alternative in the market is, is MariaDB. So are you accusing us of being loud? Uh, it could be better, but um, let's say you do a better job than other competitive products in the MariaDB MySQL ecosystem. So, so I'm actually more worried that we're not loud enough, that we don't get out to the people that should know, know about us. So, so do you have any... Um, feeling for where these people have heard about us? How have they heard about MariaDB? And they actively searched based on wanting to go away from MySQL and just found it on the web or, or, or what's the, the information channel? 
That's a good question and I cannot really answer that. So um, probably one very important source of this movie is, and this was already a big mistake Maya School has done, uh, is the distributions. Uh, the majority of our customers is installing the database via the distribution. And in the distributions, we had a huge shift in the last 10 years. So let's start with Red Hat. Red Hat was uh, distributing MySQL and they completely moved away to, to MariaDB. So you had to do a lot of extra effort on uh, Red Hat and CentOS to install MySQL. So that's one reason a lot of people shifted from MySQL to MariaDB. Now with the Red Hat 8, this has changed a little bit again, but that's another topic. Uh, with Debian, uh, maybe you know much better than me why Debian has decided uh, to abandon uh, MySQL and to go to completely to MariaDB. I've only heard rumors, so I don't want to spread rumors. Maybe you tell something about that. But Debian, uh, which is quite popular in Central Europe, uh, only provides per default MariaDB. You can change that, but you have to do, uh, you have to take special actions. And Ubuntu does both. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, a reason the people choose primarily the, the, the database which comes with the distribution, and that's in the majority of the cases to that today is my S uh, MariaDB. So, so maybe uh, one advice I have to, to MariaDB that is uh, you should really uh, take focus on the distributions. They are a good distribution channel, let's talk like that, for, for a product. So if you yeah, are in the distribution, that's horribly important. They are, and, and, and that's something that we truly are concentrating on as well. Uh, we try to do our best on it. So that was going to be one of my questions out of the three Ds, uh, uh, distribu downloads, distributions, and Docker. Where do you see people obtaining uh, MariaDB from? And, and, and you're saying it's very much the distributions. But what about, do they download it and do they use Docker as well? Do you get exposure to that? So let's the easy thing first. Docker is not really a uh, common yet. And maybe Marco Tuz has written a nice blog article about containers and Docker and Kubernetes this week. So maybe it's worth reading it. Uh, so I, we don't see Docker or containers adoption. We don't see, the, see it at all. Right. Yet. What about now using, using uh, downloading from MariaDB to Tor? Yes, so oh, if you call uh, the MariaDB repository as well as downloading, then definitely that's the source number two. So we recommend the users always to take the repository from the software vendors directly because distributions are completely delivering completely old stuff. So they are delivering MariaDB 10.3. We are now at 10.6 and think about 10.7. So distributions are old. And that's the reason I say, hey, uh, go to the repositories of the software vendors. And they have all today very good repositories and use it from there, use the newest GA release from the repositories. And uh, in the trainings, we do it anyway like that. And we see also some customers doing it in this way. Mm -hmm. so, so you are basing your training on the more or less newest version. You were mentioning 10.6 now. Yes. So last training we had last week uh, that was running on 10.6. I say always take the newest one, uh, except some customer has some serious concern because of some other reasons, but that never happened. Yeah, so, so one of those concerns might be security. So you were saying, why, uh, why has the migration happened uh, from MySQL to MariaDB in, uh, in Debian? And lots of that was, was related to how openly uh, one is dealing with uh, security breaches and, and, and setting expectations. And, and, and that's also one of the key advantages of using a, a distribution. I mean, for our side, of course, it's very, we want to make it easy for people to use the latest versions by downloading them from mariadb.org. But in all fairness, there's, there's value provided by the added security that, uh, that everybody knows that something uh, like, like uh, Debian is, is, is providing. Okay. So, uh, so then, because you, you, you stress these new releases, uh, what's, what's the attractive part of, of, of a new release? So is there any 
particular functionality of the latest versions, uh, I mean, okay, 10.3 is not a particularly new one, but out of the new functionality, do you update the training materials or, or, or how do you benefit from the new, uh, using the newest version? Okay, so what we rarely to never see is that our customers are hunting for the hot new features. So they in 95 or more percent of the use cases are just using standard legacy stuff, which was already there in MariaDB 5.5 or something like that. So maybe one exception is now JSON stuff. We hear from time to time, but I'm not aware of any new feature or let's say obvious new feature. Uh, but everything everybody thinks uh, is cool is the online uh, in place DDL commands because they are affected every day by that. But uh, what is it 10.7? Well, 10.7 is, is truly new, but like 10.6 10, 10, 10, uh, okay. features. So what are the, the cool new 10.6 features? I don't know it by heart. Do you have one or two, which is the most important? We have quite a lot of optimization features. Uh, and, and there's, I mean, we usually have a, a theme for one of, for each one of these, these releases. May, it may be security, it, it may be Oracle extensions and so on. So there's, there's a number of them. Okay. Um, but this was mostly listening to you, your, your, yeah, yeah. your uh, impressions from the front line. Yeah. So they are not really using the hot new stuff. So that's most of the cases, not an issue. Uh, for example, also the Oracle PLS call stuff, we don't really see that. So customers are not even aware of most of them. Hey panel, um, how would we uh, communicate our Oracle mode functionality better? And what does a typical Oracle to MariaDB migration look like? We see rarely customers moving from Oracle to MariaDB and asking for PLS call uh, stuff. We don't see that. Uh, optimization, uh, when you are talking about the optimizer, yes, this is an issue, but uh, with the optimizer improvements, it's typically the case that if it helps you, you don't feel it. Mm -hmm. You only feel it if it doesn't help you. Or let's say like this, if a query becomes faster, nobody complains. But if a query becomes slower, everybody starts shouting. And with the newer optimizer, we have sometimes more troubles than with the older ones. You have to be aware of that the new optimizers in stand four, uh, let's say is more tricky with the persistent statistics that maybe you have to do an analyze, which we never did before 10.4, never. And now we have to do it. Some strange effects, you do a load from a dump from the slave to the master or from a test to a prod system. And on the slave, it was fast. And on the master, it took two minutes a query. On the slave, 100 milliseconds. And then you are thinking out, what could it be? And in the beginning, it was for me, it was, I have to change my habit uh, that I have to always to think, wait, optimize the statistics becomes an issue. Before you typically say, okay, it's not cached. It's maybe the IO system. Maybe it's a different release. And now you have to add on top. Hey, pay attention about the statistics. Do an analyze first, and then we discuss again. So this is a new feature, which helps, but it also hurts. And when it hurts, you feel it. Right, right. Hey, panel, you obviously heard about Ollie's uh, frustration with uh, loading of and generation of table stats. Um, what are some options that we could do to make it better? So. Um... Looking at your classes, I mean, you, you as I understand your, your activities, it's uh, you're offering it's, it's uh, training and it's, it's consulting. So looking at the training uh, part, the, the class attendees, uh, what, what's a typical attendee? Is it a DBA or a developer or a DevOps or, or, or even a manager? Okay, managers we nearly never have. Uh, depending on the trainings we have, or most of our trainings are visited by administrators. And now what does, what does administrator mean? A classical DBA does not re nearly not exist anymore. 
So what we typically have is a system administrator, which has also to deal with the databases. So classical mm -hmm. administrator, like 10, 15 years ago, you are a DBA and that's your profession rarely exists, owned in big companies. Uh, so the typical customer is a system administrator and that with the DevOps, that's a very interesting area because I have heard a lot about it. I maybe know a little bit theory about it, but so the implementation of DevOps, at least according to my understanding, I don't see really in reality that developers also should do operations or what is the meaning of DevOps? That is supposed to be the meaning, yes. Yes, a and crossover of those two, but but you don't see those animals. Yeah, yeah. De developers don't want to do operations because that's dirty fingers and that's working in the night and uh, being confronted with a difficult unknown uh, situations and that's not what developers want to do. And the same is with the administrators. Administrators are administrators because they do not want soft want to do software development or are not good in and they want to make things running and not develop new stuff so i am not so sure if the defop concept which we are all talking about nowadays will last for the future I, maybe i'm wrong but we will see mm -hmm. so so um you say sysadmins i was going to ask of the developers, but you don't have too many of those. What what languages they use, Maria DB from, but perhaps then the sysadmins, what 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 other uh, what programming language and environments, development environments do they need to manage? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one step back to the trainings. We have also um, Maria DB developer trainings, and there we have more developers. But let's say twenty percent of our cost training um, participants are developers. So what are they using? Uh, majority is still a PHP. And then a few of them, they have Java and uh, maybe then Python and a few exotic like C++, something like that. Mm -hmm. But okay. the majority is still PHP, uh, Java. I think the Python guys, they go more to Postgres because the Python guys want to be the Java replacement and enterprise and Postgres wants to be Oracle replacement and enterprise and enterprise and enterprise fits together. So maybe we don't see too many Python people because of this. Perhaps that's a message to us that we should be talking more to this. I was actually last week giving a presentation a Python and MariaDB a match question mark in it in south africa so yeah we didn't travel there uh, but it was uh, it was uh, well received i would say and clearly postgres was was uh, quite uh, quite present there in the questions on on, on the mm -hmm. discord channel afterwards and, and uh, data science and python obviously fit well well together yeah yeah I, I, I don't want to say it's a technical issue it's more an issue in the mind postgres was always out we are enterprise and we are perfect and good and we do it the right and maria db those are the guys uh, which yeah glue the stuff together and don't do it well so that's what the postgres people say so we are the enterprise guys and they are also heading for uh, erp systems and mm -hmm. there are erp systems for maria db they, they work together i know one of them but it's not what's in the mind of people or we are uh, working currently with a federal uh, organization here in Switzerland and they completely shift the way, way from MariaDB Postgres to Postgres because uh, they say that's a real enterprise database and, and uh, Postgres will solve it. Uh, okay, those are managers who decide this, but uh, we are, as technicians, we are just laughing and say, okay, let's see uh, in, in one year again to move it back or to fix it, because I know that also Postgres people have the same problems like we have, but that's in the mind of the managers and of the enterprise software developers that uh, Postgres is enterprise and MariaDB is cheap crap. So this, this mantra, we somehow have to change. And MariaDB and former MySQL, I think, is a little bit uh, in German, selber schuld. How do you say that in English? Uh, fault. It's their own fault, yes, because we always solve it in a cheap and crappy way to make it just work. 
And that gives you after time, gives you this, it just works mentality and spirit. And you see also a lot of uh, software, which is this, developed this way. Well, it certainly comes from a background or pragmatic background of working as opposed yeah. to being feature-wise complete, but not working. But yeah. I think that, that's an old cliche from uh, the, the, the early days of uh, MySQL and, and Postgres uh, fighting e e each other, where the old truth used to be that uh, Postgres had all the functionality uh, and, uh, Maria, and MySQL had none, and uh, MySQL had all the stability and, and speed, and Postgres had none. But of course, those, those old truths then uh, uh, they, they approached each other. So, so that, that's no longer a good starting point. It's mostly a uh, set of prejudice. Yeah, sure. But it's a mantra and it's a story which is told. And the people believe in these stories. And so that's that, a good lesson for us to, to, to retell that story and in, in put the right frame onto that, uh, onto that story. So thanks for that advice. So, panel, while we're on the topic of other Postgres versus MariaDB myths and realities, what are we doing well? How has our approach to SQL standards uh, changed, both formally and standards as they've been implemented by others? And does our panel want to list features that we now match with Postgres or have moved beyond them ahead of them in um, user? Experience. So I'm uh, thinking about, uh, since you were since describing a fairly conservative crowd here with, with PHP and, and, and using um, MariaDB of the, the distros and not, not necessarily wanting the latest version and not so many DevOps and, and not using so much Docker. But what about the cloud? I mean, the cloud is, must be mainstream these days. Uh, I hear it at least from the news and from everybody. Uh, if I look at my customers, it's nearly non-existent. Okay, there are a few exceptions. Uh, last year, I had a customer who was in the Google Cloud and did some proof of concepts there. Uh, this week, I was discussing with a, a customer who wants to use the, how is it called? Uh, the Amazon... AWS. No, not AWS, the other one. <laughs> Sorry? EC2? No. Um, the S3 engine? No, no, no. This, this, uh, this database which claims to be MySQL and Postgres Aurora. compatible. Aurora. Aurora, yes, yeah, thanks. Uh, so they want to do a proof of concept with Aurora and we should help them. But then, yeah, we had some customer in India who wants to build something in a stretch data center, but that's their own um, own cloud. So we, we, we don't really see that with our customers. So our customers are 95% in Central Europe. So maybe that's one reason. I think uh, America, North America is much more clouds affine, uh, but uh, in Europe, I don't see it. I just hear it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, uh, when you're when we're talking, my Migration. You're mostly talking about migrating of my SQL, not migrating of. Well, you were actually mentioning Oracle not being that visible in that area, and SQL Server. What about Microsoft SQL Server? Or do you see other migrations except from uh, MySQL to MariaDB? Okay, uh, it's mostly MySQL to MariaDB. Oracle, we have never seen the DB2, not SQL Server. We were not involved in the migration. We have heard people moving from SQL Server to, to MariaDB, but uh, I was asking why, and there was no good reason except costs. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I sometimes wondering, uh, moving away from Microsoft SQL Server on Windows to MariaDB on Windows, is that a good fit? But that's up to the customer to, to decide that. Okay, it works, but maybe it's not I would say the other one is the dream team. So, okay. Uh, then we had a strange uh, migration a few years ago, which was from Ingress, I think, or some very strange database. 
to MariaDB. That's it. Mm -hmm. So the majority of migrations we see is from MySQL to MariaDB. Rarely the other way around. This exists, but only rarely. And it's typically a management decision and not a technical decision. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For example, we had last week a discussion with a customer. They now move away from MariaDB and the mayor's ma management said, uh, we, we are um, a stock market listed company and we only want to work with a stock market listed company. So that's Oracle, MySQL, MariaDB is not on the stock market. I cannot follow this uh, decision or this explanation, but if they that their management decided that way, then that's yeah, it's fine for me. Okay, so um, I would want to move to a couple of uh, questions with uh, your advice to to us. Um, so we we covered a lot of technical questions. Now um, our goal is to drive adoption. Uh, to grow the user base. What are we missing at the MariaDB Foundation? So I have the impression that working with the community was much better before the big split in 2010. And I think that the user base is uh, or are the best evangelists for you. So it's typically the users, that means the developers in first priority, the admins, which vote for MariaDB. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, as we see, uh, it's rarely the management. So we typically come to a customer via the technicians and not via the management. It happens, but very, very rarely. So the user base are your evangelists are your fanboys. And I, I think um, before there was better work with the community. You are doing this um, MariaDB server fest, yes. Uh, you're de doing things like there was a, you had a boot at the FOSTEM, at the FrostCon, at the Chemnitzer Linux target, all these big events which are not happening anymore at the moment. Uh, but you could be a little bit more present there. That's a good piece of advice. So th thanks for that. Now, you were mentioning uh, events that no longer happen. So one doesn't know what will happen in the post-pandemic world, uh, world and, and how post-pandemic it will be. So will there be hybrid events? Uh, so how would you like to meet with both with us and with your uh, colleagues and, 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 and the user base? What's your vision for how to meet in Shall we say, well, there's going to be one kind of FOSDEM, you never know what kind of a FOSDEM in uh, early, early February 2022. Uh, how do you see envision? Uh, how do you envision uh, events uh, now coming uh, up? Yeah, so the, the very best thing is would be if you could meet face to face. So having together a beer, eating a pizza or whatever, meeting on an event that's not happening anymore for the moment, but that that would be great for a lot of them. And in the evening, the big pizza party, you have maybe also been there somewhere in a restaurant in Brussels. That's yeah. really cool. You can talk with the people. You can talk with the people on the event, but that doesn't happen. So you do the MariaDB Server Fest, which is, yeah, which is Finally. good. Uh, I really loved it to, to talk with some people uh, on the Tulip chat. Uh, I also I like to, 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 to poke a little bit the people and to stress a little bit people because then you get a good or honest answers. So I really like that, but unfortunately this is, yeah, just virtual, but that's good. But the promotion of that, I was a little bit disappointed uh, at some of the server fest participants. It was, I don't know, please correct me, 50 or 20, 30 in some of the speeches, for example, on the speech of uh, Sergei Petrunia. I don't know, I, I would expect much more people because He's a genius on his, his topic. So everybody who's interested in ESCO query tuning should be there and listening for him. And so maybe I maybe that was not really aware uh, in the world, this server fest. So you need new channels to inform people. Or MariaDB blog, Planet MySQL was great. And now they just completely destroyed it. And you did not manage yet 
planet MariaDB to replace them completely. True, true. We have or, to do that. So yeah. how, but uh, I, do you have channels for us to be present on where we do not understand to be present right now? Okay, so I can tell you where I am. I am on uh, Xing, which is for ger German speaking Europe. There is a Myers on a MariaDB channel. The same on LinkedIn, which is international. Uh, then I'm on Facebook. I'm not so much on uh, Instagram. And how's the other call? I forgot the name. And if you look there at the two communities, Myers School versus MariaDB, it's maybe 10 to 1, the, the participants. So uh, people have not yet realized that MariaDB is not the same anymore than MySQL and that you should also follow the MariaDB channel if you are talking about MariaDB, not only the MySQL channel. So a little bit more at, at advertisement that there is a MariaDB blog, there is a MariaDB planet, there are MariaDB forums, channels on all these social platforms. And that's one thing one should do. So maybe you are already doing it. The other That's thing. Always good, good pieces of advice. Uh, we should, I mean, those, uh, you, you touch sore points in our uh, conscience, uh, uh, but, but you also underline uh, the, the way that we should probably move ahead. So those are very good pieces of, of advice. Uh, so that was the, the advice around uh, adoption, uh, like making ourselves known. To our users, do you think I was going to pick on panelists all this time? No, it's your turn. Lift up your keystrokes and actually type out what kind of communities you are in. There's some that you're undoubtedly in where MariaDB should be participating in and, and showing off its features. So let us just know on a uh, Zulip or YouTube comment. Or um, What about the technical uh, side? So what do we need in order to do in order to improve upon the code base? So do you have... Uh, moments where you think, oh, how stupid can it be? How, why do they not fix this easy thing? Do you have uh, technical wishes? Ollie, don't be shy. Tell us what you really think. Don't hold back now. That's a difficult question, technical issues. So we are sometimes filing bug reports about things we see out there. Uh, for example, last week uh, we set up a Galera cluster and the customer did not, in the training, yes, and they did the typo in the configuration file. And then typically the server does not start anymore and it's writing in the error log, this and this variable, I don't know, but then it was crashing. Mm -hmm. So really with a stack trace and you see uh, improper error handling. So I understand that the developers say, okay, that's not an important bug. We don't fix it, but it looks ugly. So the customer were looking at that and there was a C++ developer. They say, no, that, that's impossible. They crash. And we had two of those crashes in a, five, in a three day training. So that's, which leads to the, the feeling of the people, oh, this software is not really stable yet or properly developed. I don't know. Maybe technically it doesn't matter if at the error handling, after the error handling, the server crashes, but it looks ugly. Uh, then we, ha we had uh, some time ago a uh, situation very, very uh, uh, ugly with uh, MariaDB 10.4 upgrading a cluster. On Friday, the customer did an upgrade Friday afternoon. Uh, because not so much traffic anymore, upgrade worked fine. Uh, on Saturday, Sunday, not a lot of traffic during the weekend. And then on Monday, the, uh, the traffic started. And then the cluster more or less exploded. And they did not know what to do. And then finally, they somehow rescued themselves by just running on one Galera node during the day to just keep business up. So luckily, they did not have so much load that they could not manage it with one Galera node. Mm -hmm. But if they would be doomed, they would be offline for the whole day. And then in the evening, they did the downgrade again. And that are things which is really, really nasty for the customers. And they were so somewhat of disappointed and afraid of the product. And so this error handling was going to be one area um, that I was going to probe uh, with you because it's it sort of a favorite 
uh, pet peeve, as the Americans say from my side, with error messages that are uh, stupid or something. They are literally correct, but, but they don't hint at all at what the real error is. And, and a somewhat more careful uh, checking or asserting would, would alert people and say, hey, you have a spelling error in your, in your yeah. configuration file. So you, you highlighted one such issue. If, if you have more of those, by all means, tell them to us because, because they, they are usually off, uh, off also not that hard to fix once you know that they really are pain points and, and one yeah. could see the pain from your customers reflected even in your eyes uh, here when you described yeah. it. That would be really, really great. But that's not MariaDB only issue. That's an issue with developers in general. I think they hate writing proper error message and proper error handling. Uh, we also have some software and we have the rule in the company, every error exit in all the code we have must, be, uh, must have a unit error code number. So if you come with the error code number 4242, I can tell you exactly in the code, where did you do an exit? And typically, if you do an error code handling, you, you do uh, if this equals or not equals this, then exit uh, terminate. So mm -hmm. in the error message, you can easily write, I have compared this value and the content was that with that variable and the content was that, and it did not fix exit code 4242 terminate. And that helps, I would say in 75% of the cases already helps the power user to fix the issue itself without opening a ticket. True, that, that, yeah. that, those are wise words. So I would, uh, I have to illustrate with a war story from my side, which is about uh, Python error messages. So this was pre-Python 3, it, it, it gets fixed with UTF-8. So my last name, uh, if you take the fir first four characters out of my last name, you will get an A, an R, an N, and half of an O, half of an E. And, yeah. and, and the concept of having half a letter, it doesn't really uh, click in my head. So I was never even thinking about those, those things. I was uh, cutting strings at a fixed point and, and got, got errors uh, at random points, which did not say, uh, uh, I did not hint at all at what the, the real uh, culprit was. Yes, yes. Yeah, and I can yeah. imagine that we do similar things with, with MariaDB. So more care towards the, the, the error messages is what, what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, and just also with the error code, if I know uh, the 4242 error code is unique, I can do a grab on the source and I cannot change MariaDB code. I'm not, not good enough for this. But if I can look at the code, I s at least understand why it failed. If the error message is bad, I can at least look at the code and then try to understand why it failed and fix it. And you might be able to give a better error report to us yeah, so that we can fix okay. it. Yes. it uh, Definitely. Yeah. That's a good, really, really good point. Uh, what have I forgotten to, to ask you about that you wish to, to tell the viewers? Optimizer we were talking about. Ah, oh, documentation. So um, MariaDB documentation is quite good. I like it. Like everything, it could be more perfect, but it's quite good. So maybe we should talk a little bit about documentation process or I don't know. Sure. So uh, how do we file documentation bugs or missing stuff? I have uh, opened the documentation bug last for last week about there is something missing. Uh, I don't understand from everything in the documentation how this exactly works. How do I deal with that? So the, the way to deal with it is, is to leave a comment on the corresponding page and, and, and we should deal with, we shall deal with it in due course. But, but of course that in due course might take, take a while. Uh, you, you being a person that, that, that comes to, to force them, uh, you might uh, know Ian Gilfillan in person. So you might ping him if there's something where, where you, you feel that there's a specific need to fix stuff and where you're inside uh can can where well, you can give more more insight to the matters that's one way for you to, to to approach us but basically commenting on the pages uh of the knowledge base is the way to go 
we see a lot of, uh, first of all, people don't read the comments when they have a problem above, they don't read the comments below. That's one thing. If I read sometimes- The, the purpose for the comment is for us to fix the text yeah. above. That, 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 that is the logic. Of course, that, that uh, takes its time. Okay. Uh, the second thing is I see a lot of comments which are quite old, which are still there. So that uh, is not really trustworthy for me to comment there. So then I go maybe the way uh, write an email to Ion directly. Right. So depends how you want to have it. Yeah, we'll take up that discussion with with Ian uh, how how we should how we should set expectations on it. But I'm happy that you found our uh, documentation mostly good. Anything else on the documentation that, that we should take away? Except that it is not 100% complete, what it never will be now that that's okay. I would say it's okay. What sometimes is disturbing, but maybe you cannot or you do not want to solve it always. If I Google for something, MariaDB this and this, I end up with the enterprise documentation, which is crap, and then further down with the community documentation, which is good. So I first click on the crappy documentation, and then somehow I find, okay, that's the wrong one, so I go to the second one. So maybe a search engine optimization, or I don't know how, do you, how, how one can solve this, would help. Mm -hmm. so the better documentation first. Good to know, good to know. So I think this uh, should uh, conclude our, our story from the front lines with uh, Oli Senhauser. So thank you, Oli, for great insights. We will try to, to implement your thoughts and learn from what you told us. Thank you, Oli. Thank you, Kai, that I got the chance to, to tell something and let's see what happens with it. Very good. Thank you. So, good morning, good afternoon, good time of day. I'm Kai Arne, the CEO of Maria DB Foundation, and I have the pleasure to do, talk to Felix Schuster, the managing director and co founder of Edgeless Systems in Bochum, Bochum, Germany. Welcome, Felix. Thank you. Hello, Kai. So, so you and your company are new to most participants of our server minifest. So, so to get going, uh, I'll ask you a couple of simple questions about edgeless DB and what is called uh, confidential computing. So on the top level, you're talking about a super secure version of MariaDB server, as I understand it. And last time I looked, it was MariaDB 10.5.11 and running on special hardware uh, that enables so-called enclaves. Is that the, the overall picture? Is that right? That is the overall picture, yes. We, we essentially took MariaDB and ported it to the enclave environment and added a few bells and whistles. So, so, so what is an enclave? I mean, I know that the Vatican City and San Marino are enclaves, <laughs> sovereign states surrounded by Italy, and Lesotho is surrounded by South Africa. Is this something similar? It is something similar. It's a, it's a nice anal analogy. Um, so an enclave is your own space that's encapsulated by a hostile environment. So if you, if you think about Italy as a hostile environment to, to the Vatican, possibly, I don't know, um, then you, you almost get the right picture already. And an enclave, in more technical terms, you can think of it as a, a highly secure mini virtual VM that you can create on a possibly untrustworthy system. Okay, so we'll get more into that, uh, into details of that. Um, I'd like first to ask a comparison to other database security approaches and security uh, solutions. I mean, all database uh, offer access control and disk encryption. So I suspect this is something more than that. Actually, with most databases, we, we, we consider that, that no hundreds, or probably a thousand databases, only a few of those actually have encryption uh, on disk. Uh, on buyer, yes, because as I say, it's so easy, not on disk. Hmm. I'm defending one myself. That was his claim. Uh, it, there's like thousands of databases, or well, many databases that do have it. This is not their claim to fame. That's, that's the main point. They're doing no. something beyond it. Yeah, so let's let's learn about what that is. Exactly. So 
if you just take a look at what these enclaves provide us, so they are available on on many recent Intel Intel CPUs, and they are also available on uh, on on cloud providers like Azure or, or Ali Cloud. And I, as a programmer, I can go and I can tell the CPU to create an enclave for me, just like I can tell the CPU to add two numbers for me. Right? Or I can tell it to create a virtual VM, a virtual machine, for example. And, and now this enclave has three inter interesting properties, essentially. And the first one being isolation. And we already spoke a bit about isolation. So you can think of the enclave as being an environment that's, that's strictly isolated from the rest of its, of, of its host. That's the first, the first important feature. And the second important feature, and maybe that's, that's, that's even more exciting, is that everything that resides inside an enclave is always encrypted in, in main memory. So we can, we can say that this enclave gives us runtime encryption for our, our data and our code. That's, that's the, the second important property. And this is what most people are the most excited about when they talk about enclaves. And now there is a third property and the third property is verifiability. So if I have now running this enclave in, in, in the cloud, um, I can verify that it is indeed a good enclave running on genuine Intel hardware. And I can verify precisely what is running inside there. So I can verify that there is indeed MariahDB in a certain version, a certain configuration running inside that enclave. And then I can create a secure channel and, and set my data over with confidence. Mm -hmm. So, so you said. I mean, I was already mentioning encryption, but that was disk encryption. You're yes. not saying that it's encrypted also in in memory. Yes, correct. Yeah, and you, and you mentioned the two basic security measures that that databases normally apply, which are access control and disk encryption. And these are great, right? And they are they are necessary. Um, but enclaves, they they can enforce these measures, mm -hmm. right? So if you, if you think about a malicious administrator, for example, right, you're, you're running your, your MariahDB on, on a system that's not fully trustworthy, maybe you don't trust the administrator, then normal access control and disk encryption only protect you partially from the administ administrator because he or she, they are able to, to bypass these mechanisms, right? They can maybe just directly read from your, from your process, from, from, from your, your database's main memory, or they can rearrange data on disk while the database is running and do many, many complicated things in order to either corrupt your data or get access to your data. And if you're running your database inside an enclave, and you take some additional measures, you can protect against threats like a malicious administrator. So, so you really trust nobody. Uh, uh, so what, what, are, what is a, a use case for that? I mean, what's a scenario where you, uh, with the, the customer of your, of your databases realize that you cannot trust their their admins, what are basically the use cases for a confidential database like HSDB? So I think this also uh, means that you can't trust your kernel as well, right? I think that's that's the implied notion here. There's really nothing to trust. You, you, that you might even have vulnerable <coughs> systems that you want to make sure that they don't read your data. Well, if you don't turn the data center, then somebody else has physical access to your machine. That would be a good reason to have some concern about what level of trust you can have. The thing is that I still don't really get it. If things are encrypted uh, in a one way in your memory, how do you then write things to disk? Because that can't have used the same encryption. The encryption key? What, what do you mean? It doesn't have to. Yeah, but that means still that, that, that if you then don't 
don't use encryption or database, everything is still open. Because when you, you do you, use encryption everywhere. No, but then they, they, I don't think that they can use the key on the, send the same key on the database. And, they should. and he doesn't say that he uses the same key. No, they didn't modify RocksDB. They're only using RocksDB to store data because RocksDB writes only once and never changes it again, apparently. Actually, they change it because when they do this uh, recollection, they, they change things. And they are getting in ODB as well, so... I think he said that that particular block never changes. Maybe pointers to it change, but the block itself never changes. No, actually they can be sorted. And they, began, they, 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 they basically do merge sort between things to, 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 to uh, compact things. But does that change their position on disk or just pointers to it? And then they, they, it becomes new, file, new files. Hmm. And if they're new files, they, 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 they will change the access on disk. Okay. But they, they, of course they can fix that, the merge, merge press, they only need to fix it in one place. Maybe they fix it then, yeah. But, uh, and they said the same thing with, with SSH, when they connect to the, to the outside, they still need to uh, decompress, uh, de uh, uh, this is... Decrypt. Yeah, uh, they, uh, how would the CPU do this? They, they would decrypt by page, they have, basically have to do that. Then they need to store this, uh, this unencrypted page somewhere, while they, while they use it. Because you can't... Uh, un 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 Un, uh, unencrypt uh, byte by byte. There's no way you can do that efficiently. Or uh, they, they're doing it per page, but the the enclave is is transparent to this on this encryption. Uh, but so the enclave sees that page, but nobody else does. No, but you, you, you can still uh, as a system you can see every page. You can't have this un. Uh, yeah, un but whatever is it's in memory, it's encrypted with the enclave's key, except the page that you're just working on. Every byte in there. Yeah, but the thing is that when the CPU is reading it, it will not decrypt it by byte by byte by byte. It will take the page, put it somewhere else, unencrypted, so be able to, to use it page by page. You have a point. Know. We need Felix to answer that. Yeah. I think may, when the mem copy happens, <clears> the mem copy <throat> does the uh, compression to enclave and then it decrypts uh, the on disk encryption. Yeah, but I still don't see how I, because it needs to have an unencrypted data somewhere. And then if then you that data at least only only in CPU caches. It will never be in RAM. You can, you, can, you, you can still access data in CPU caches. Not with this feature. Okay. Yeah. So there are there are two primary use cases. First one is additional security. And I think we we already painted a picture there, right? You if you if you use edgeless DB, which is Mariah DB running inside an enclave, you get additional security properties. This is the, the first use case. Take your database security to the next level. The other use case is that you can use these nice new properties to build new applications that possibly weren't possible before. And I would be an example of that. Of course. So think about, um, we now have this enclave and it's running a database and we can verify this enclave and we know that no one can look inside it. No one can manipulate it. So we can use it as a trusted third party to, to pool or share data. Think for example about banks wanting to, to pull customer data to identify fraud, right? Maybe they, they have two customer databases and they want to cross check which of these customers maybe is, uh, well, which of these customers are common between them and who of them are maybe doing dubious transfers. Now, in, 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 the, in the existing world, they would have the problem that they would need a trusted third party, some custodian to help them with cross-checking the data because typically they wouldn't want to reveal the data to each other. And now if you have a, a confidential database, you can use that as a, as a trusted third party, like, like as a neutral middle ground. And you can, you can set it up maybe in the cloud. You can, both parties can verify that 
there is a database that has precisely the properties that they wanted to have. And then they can send over their data and they can make sure that only certain queries are run on that data and that only certain parties get access to the results. That, that makes is sense to me. So, so then um, going on on this technical side of it, um, that, that, uh, I mean, I see the uh, benefit of it. I see, see what the use case is, uh, but I'm sure it also means uh, additional computing so how many percent if you will is the performance penalty for for all of that yeah so in the past enclaves could be rather expensive um, but the latest generation of intel cpus um, the third generation xeons the ice lake line of cpus they have some some great performance improvements and in some benchmarks, the overhead can be very small. Um, in, but on average, it is it is in the like thirty percent. This, this is like 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 ballpark what you will get in a in a complex benchmark like TPCC. You will never become a politician because you gave an exact answer to the question I asked. Thirty percent. <laughs> Yeah. So of course, I mean, you, you know, you know this uh, probably better than I do, uh, or possibly better than I do. Benchmarks. It always depends on this on, on, on the setting, and it depends on the precise parameters. Right. But on average, what 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 we are seeing is like TPC seen in 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 different configurations could be like thirty percent, give or take. Yeah, of course, number. that's not not an exact number, but it gives you the order of magnitude. It's yeah. not like and a 2x and it's not 1%. So 30% yes, is, exactly. is, is a good figure to, to understand. So, so then, uh, so that was one of my technical questions. Another one is how difficult is it to use? I mean, uh, the setup, the installation and setup, is that the only difficulty or does it also require changes in the application architecture? The, the new use case you said, uh, where, where instead of having a third party, uh, that, that you uh, entrust. The, of course, that is that is a different architecture, but that's probably a simpler architecture than having a third party. But, but if you just wish to uh, to use an enclave, is the difficulty in the installation and setup or also in the application architecture? Yeah, so the, the, the quick answer is there's not much difficulty. We try to make this as, as seamless as possible. And if you want to run edgeless DB, it, you, you, you need to do two things, essentially. You need to have an enclave-enabled CPU, like a recent Intel Xeon with Intel SGX capabilities. And then you need to run our Docker image. That is what you need to do. And this can be like, like, like super easy. If you, if you have a corresponding CPU, maybe on-prem or maybe in the cloud, maybe in Azure, then you may be just good to go and you can type in docker run and then well, the image and some, some, some parameters and then you have your confidential database. That is pretty, pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Um, if you like it even simpler, you can, you can even go to the Azure Marketplace and there is a free offering where you can with a few clicks get a out of the box HSDB running in, in, in the cloud. So that's that's super simple. I looked up SGX, which is what you've been mentioning here, is software guard extensions. So is that something that uh, most new Xeons have, or is it is the special edition of Xeon? And also, uh, is uh, this uh, enclaves concept something that, that is Intel specific? Yes. So. Um, let's unfold this. We, if you have a recent Intel server CPU, um, chances are rather high that you, you have SGX capabilities. And you, if you go to intel.com and you type in your, your CP, CPU serial number, you, you will be able to check if you have SGX capabilities. Or maybe you can just check in your operating system. Um, in the past, Intel used to also used to add this to, to client CPUs, like 
couple of the older Core i7, Core i5 CPUs have it. And you can also run Azure CPU on that, but it's really made for the, for the server CPUs because that makes the most sense. And, and also they are, they are quite a bit faster. Mm -hmm. um, if you're running the cloud, you, you need to make sure that you have that you're you're running on a on, on a VM that ha explicitly has support for for SGX. So if you if you go to Azure or to Ali Cloud, uh, you need to make sure to to select a, a VM size that explicitly explicitly has support for SGX. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about non-Intel things? Right. Um, so AMD has has similar capabilities, but it works a bit differently there. So for now, HSTV only runs on, on the Intel version of, of secure enclaves. Okay, so, so let me now go to the topic of, of uh, integration between HSTV and, and MariaDB. So uh, why did you, why and how did you choose MariaDB? Yes, so what we, we started with the idea of, of, of building a confidential database. And we initially, we, we weren't even database experts and we didn't quite know what to pick. I mean, the, the market is huge and confusing, right? Um, but what we, what we figured after many discussions with potential partners and customers is that SQL is still a very important feature, even in a, in a world where, where there is no SQL and, and so forth. And also, MySQL and MariaDB are two very well-known standards, right? And um, people know what MariaDB is, people know what MySQL is. And uh, oftentimes, if you have something that is compatible with these, you can just plug, plug into an existing interface at, at your customer and they can, they can just proceed as normal. Um, and that's, that's great. This is why we pick MariaDB. Um, and on the other hand, of course, MariaDB being open source and having a, an active community also is what was great, great for us and played, played a great role in our decision because we really needed to, to have something that is well built and open source, battle proven. And that led us to MariaDB. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, another technical basis uh, that, that you're building upon is, is my rocks. And that is a bit of a surprise. I mean, if you go with what people know and what people use, that would be InnoDB, but uh, you're basing it on, on my rocks. And how come? Yes. So the, the current version of HSDB is, is indeed based on my rocks. Um, go, we, we know that my rocks has some limitations. For example, it, it still does not support foreign keys, which is probably the biggest the biggest limitation. Um, so, so going forward, we, we really would love to support InnoDB as well. The, the reason why we picked MyRox is that it has an interesting internal architecture called uh, SST tables. And these SST tables, they can be encrypted in a very nice and efficient way. In a, well, and also in a way that is fit for the threat model that we are considering with Edge DB. So in a nutshell, without going too much into detail, um, MyRox only produces read-only files. It never, it, it never modifies data files on disk. And that allows us to very efficiently encrypt these files and integrity protect these files. And we, we don't need to, to use fancy data structures like Merkle trees. Um, we, we, we can sidestep that and still get very good security properties that you normally don't get. Um, and we like the, the property that we get is we essentially get integrity for your entire database state at any given time. So not only integrity for a single file or, or, or table in a, in, a, in a database, we, we get integrity for the entire snapshot. And mm -hmm. this is important in an enclave threat model because we don't trust the administrator, we don't trust the host operating system. So we need to make sure that everything is always protected against 
these very strong attackers that we consider. And that was the, the reason for us to choose Myrox. Um, and we're looking forward to, to porting these properties to, to InnoDB. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, you've been mentioning Azure and, and Ali Cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, what about other clouds? Mm -hmm. Yes. So GCP and AWS, they don't have the capabilities that we require. So they don't enable SGX in, 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 in their VMs. And this may change in the future. Hopefully it will. Um, and there are a couple of smaller cloud vendors that, that enable, enable SGX. So if we, if we look at the European cloud landscape, maybe most notably OVH has support for SGX. So you can run HSDB on OVH if you, if you want to. Okay. Yeah. Good, good. So, uh, and then uh, another technology question. So you're basing uh, your HSDB, of course, on your own technology and on MariaDB. Uh, what about uh, front ends and other uh, free and open source technology that, that you work with? Is, is, are there any other um, components to it? Yes. So, first of all, everything is open source. Um, and this is very important. I mean, open source has value in itself, right? Or it, it, it has different. There are, different there, 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 there are different reasons to open source software, but especially in the confidential computing and enclave context, it's, it's even more important because as I said earlier, one important aspect of confidential computing is that you can verify precisely what is, what is running inside your enclave. So if you don't have open source running inside your enclave, then it's difficult to really make a good assessment of the contents and the functionality of your enclave. So that's a very strong point for, for open source in, in this setting. Um, and yeah, we already discussed MariaDB, of course, we discussed MyRox. And there are a couple of other open source components that we, 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 we stitched together to build HSDB. There, we are using a framework called Open Enclave. So this sort of the, the standard for the basic framework for building Enclave software. It originally came out of Microsoft, but it's now, it has been donated and it's being maintained by the Linux Foundation. So we, so we build on top of that and we have our own compatibility layer on top of that, that emulates certain sy system calls that MariaDB requires that are not present in Open Enclave. And next to that, we have a, a front end that we've written in Go that's also running inside the Enclave. And this front end adds advanced Enclave specific features that normally don't come with MariaDB. And it exposes an easy to use REST API. And essentially that REST API allows you to do three things. It allows you to verify the integrity and the identity of the, of the enclave using, using, using a simple web request. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is it allows you to recover the database in case of failure because one important feature of enclaves is that they can securely store state in between, in between restarts. And we, we make that easy to use. And the, the last important feature is that you can use this front end to set what we call a manifest. And this manifest- And now you talk about this uh, manifest. So what is this manifest feature about? I, I hear it's a JSON file and I've heard it being compared to a smart contract, but I don't know what the smart contract is. So can you expand a bit about this concept of manifest? Yes, yes, yes. yes. I think it's a very interesting concept. And uh, the comparison with a smart contract, I think it helps. So smart contract, as you may know, comes from the blockchain world. It is a, a contract that's written in code, right? Um, something that the different parties agree on. And in our case, this manifest, it defines the, it's a JSON file, a simple JSON file that defines the initial state of the database. So you can, you can define 
a set of tables, you can define a set of users, and you can define certificate authorities that are used to identify those users. But can, cannot uh, an evil sysadmin go and tweak that JSON file to his heart's or her heart's content? That, that is a very good question. And, 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 and normally, yes. But since we're using computational computing and we use some, 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 some cool tricks here, what, what happens is once you, you set the money, you can only set the manifest once initially, right? You start up the, the database, it is in an uninitialized state, and then you can upload your manifest. And once you've uploaded it, it becomes part of the enclave attestation statement that you verify. So if you go and verify uh, HSCB instance running somewhere, you learn A, that it's running on secure hardware inside a secure enclave. You learn the precise version of the software that's running there. And three, or, or, or C, you learn that there is a certain manifest and, and, and you learn the contents of that manifest. And you can, based on that information, you can decide if you can trust the database or not. And if there was malicious admin and they just put a wrong manifest there, it would be evident immediately. I remember that actually, I think I like I said that I wonder how they do upgrades in all these secure manners. That would have interesting follow up questions at some point. Right. So, so uh, you probably can get some extra benefits or features out of this this manifest. Have you? Do you have any examples for how to practically use manifests? Yes. So that ties back to the use cases that we spoke about earlier. Um, the new apps that become possible. And um, I spoke about this example of the two banks wanting to, to, to cross compare or, or pool customer data. And in that case, you would use the manifest to define who is able to do what in the database and also define the identities of these parties. So before, before sending that data, the banks could verify the manifest and all the other things and then they would know precisely what this database can do and what it what it cannot do. Mm -hmm. well, why can't uh, that just be in the user table? Or yeah, no, I don't see the reason why that's just could be that's not my answer. Because you have the exact same set of privileges there. Yeah, actually, you have more. Yeah. Um, so I think we're ending, uh, getting closer to the allocated time here. I still have two questions for you. So. Uh, if one wants to try it out, how can one do it? I mean, you were mentioning uh, going on, on Azure and, 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 and testing there. Is that the best way to try out and kick the tires of HLSDB? Yeah, possibly the easiest way is to, to go to, to Azure, to the Azure Marketplace and, and search for HLSDB um, or go to GitHub and search for HLSDB. And there we have a couple of, of Docker images and you can just pull the Docker image if you have the corresponding hardware at your disposal. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, so, before my concluding question, I, I, I'd like to ask you: What did I forget to ask you? What, what would you have wished that I would uh, that that I would ask you to get the more for the uh, audience to get a more complete picture of of HSDB? I hope that Kai would ask: What's the business model, and how do they make money, and are they fully open source? Because that actually is uh, at least interesting to me. Um, I think. We, we, we touched on, on, on all of the important aspects. Um, yeah, we spoke about the foundations, confidential computing and the secure enclaves. We spoke about the use cases being additional security and new exciting applications where you want to share and pool data in a secure way. Um, we spoke about the manifest. We spoke about briefly about the open source architecture. I, I think we've covered it all. Um, yeah. So then I have a concluding question for you. Why did you call it Edgeless DB? <laughs> yeah. Um, because our company is called Edgeless Systems and it kind of made it kind of made sense. And maybe now the next question is why did we call the company Edgeless Systems? And the answer here is it kind of sounds cool. Um, 
at least to German ears. I'm not sure if, if that's true internationally, um, but it it means end-to-end -end secure without a gap, without an edge between. It's just from here to there, everything is always encrypted all the time. That that's makes sense to my semi-German, semi-Finnish here. So <laughs> those are good, good uh, concluding words. Thank you, Felix Schuster. Very, very interesting presentation. Yes, thank you for having me. Um... So, my friends didn't come back for the last film, and I think you don't want me to comment upon an interview that I was doing myself, so the last uh, video will be without commentary. I'm Kai Arne, CEO of the MariaDB Foundation, and for this session, I'm interviewing Sergei Golubchik, Vice President of Engineering for MariaDB Server. Welcome, Sergei. Thanks. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. So this interview is about the MariaDB 10.7 preview releases, the goals behind them and how it was implemented and what the lessons from them were. Now, I think you are the father of this preview release idea, aren't you, Sergei? Well, I wouldn't say that. There was lots of people involved in, well, designing and implementing this thing. Uh, so if, I don't know, if you would think about it as a Avalanche, then I was the one who threw in the first snowball, but then it was definitely not only me, it was a collective effort. Okay, so you threw the snowball on this one. So I will ask you about your role, uh, which explains to the audience why you were the one throwing the sn snowball, but let me first set the stage a bit by pointing out our earlier communication on this topic, and by our, I mean Marie Divi Foundation. Uh, so uh, that background is two basic blogs and eight feature blogs on the preview releases from roughly two months ago. Those are not required reading in any way for this session, so you will, you will get a summary of them. Uh, but we will also look at how this experiment worked out, since we now have two months of experience from the preview releases. Uh, the, pre the big picture of the idea was presented in a series of two blogs in September, challenges and visions for MariaDB server and 10.7.0 comes as preview releases. And then we had eight detailed blogs and I will briefly mention them too also for two reasons. So one, we don't want to be too abstract in this session and uh, hence go into concrete issues. But also while we're at it, we also want to promote the features of MariaDB 10.7 as I think they are quite exciting. So there's eight of them. The first one was UUID data type. And there's a blog about these universally unique identifiers by Daniel Black. Now, number two is natural sort. And natural sort means that a string A10 comes after A9 and not like it would in alphabetical order between A1 and A2. And there's an uh, Anil Husakovich blog on that. The third one is about compression provider plugins loading compression libraries on request at runtime, and that's by Robert Binder. And then there's JSON histogram, to which I think we will return here. There's an optimizing feature, a blog by Vicenzo Ciorbaru. I had the pleasure to write a blog about Python-like string formatting. Uh, so that's the S format, curly brackets type of, of uh, string formatting, and that was the fifth one. The sixth is uh, a blog you wrote, Sergey, about convert partition, and that's a convenient and crash safe alter table syntax for partitioning changes. And then there was um, a password reuse check plugin blog, uh, which is about MariaDB forcing new passwords to be new by Ian Gilfillan. And the last one uh, out of the eight blogs was written by Eric Herman, our chairman. Uh, miscellaneous features. One of them, he was very much involved in himself. That was JSON equals, so that you can 
compare with the JSON strings, which are uh, from a literal as, as a character based uh, interpretation, they might be different from, but from a JSON perspective, they should equal each other. So, so that's it. That, that, that's, that's the background uh, backdrop that we have for this interview. So now let's go into why you, Sergei, uh, is the person that I'm interviewing about these preview releases. So I've always thought of you as a bit of an eminence gris, uh, a gray eminence working behind the scenes with, for example, Monty visible uh, to everyone and, and, and highly, highly vocal. But you've been responsible for some of the most important decisions since 10 years before MariaDB even started. So, so um, your title is, is uh, Vice President of uh, Server Engineering, but what's your role within MariaDB Foundation? I'm a board member of MariaDB Foundation. And uh, what does that mean, for instance, when it comes to code contributions? It has absolutely nothing to do with code contributions. No, I mean, your, I mean, your, your I mean, board role. My, my, in my role as a board member of MariaDB Foundation, I do absolutely nothing with uh, contributions. I did, that but in true, a different role. Uh, so in what, in what capacity do you, uh, are you involved in, in code contributions? So, um, well, I love uh, community contributions. I think it's very important for MariaDB to have uh, thriving uh, de developer ecosystem with developers. And uh, for example, I participated in Google Summer of Code as a mentor since like 2008. But so I always wanted uh, MariaDB well, to support, to work well with uh, contributors. And because we are now on GitHub, it was mostly about pull requests and maybe five years ago or something, that's when I started hitting the rule that every pull request should be answered, well, should get the first answer in within a given reasonably short time frame. It doesn't mean it will be completely accepted within this, but it should definitely get some attention. And there was a set of a procedure a process how to handle them and we had a dedicated developer, Sergei Wojtovich, who was, well, besides many other things, was making sure that every pull request gets a needed amount of attention. And I imagine it might have been not fun every single time, but it worked uh, very well and it paid off. We have number of pull requests, it grew. We got a very active developer community, but that was and now I don't do anything with contributions at all. It's completely on MariaDB Foundation and MariaDB Foundation developers. So I, I don't. I'll, uh, so what about the similar? Yeah, the, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I, I was going to ask a similar question around your relationship to Linux distributions. I, I suppose the general tone of your answer will be the same, but I, I'm interested in your personal thinking and yes. your. A relationship to Linux distributions. Yes, and uh, the answer will be completely different. I don't have, I don't never had any role as far as Linux distributions are concerned. I do occasionally communicate with uh, MariaDB maintainers in various, various Linux distributions when we are discussing uh, distribution specific bugs in MariaDB or something like packaging or, for example, security issues that security teams in those distributions very much want to know about, but that's it. So I have very little role dealing with. So with all that background, uh, Linux distributions, uh, uh, foundation corporation and code contributions, I think you have a, um, a bit of a challenge uh, answering this question when it comes to what kind of a constituency, constituency you, you, you represent. So, I think it's fair to say that you represent both the community, the foundation, and the corporation. But what's your take on that? Well, uh, I'm an employee of Marie for Corporation. Uh, they pay my salary, and my goal is to do what's uh, best for Marie Corporation. But uh, so that's. But I uh, deeply believe that uh, 
having a successful MariaDB server project and which is used everywhere and a thriving developers community is what's best for MariaDB corporation. So that's what I'm doing. So there's no contradiction here. I just uh, do what I believe in. So then let's turn to the first blog, the challenges and visions for MariaDB server. So not all of the items in that blog are related to the 10.7 preview uh, releases, but since I have you here available to answer questions, I'd like to ask some uh, things about the other items. And first on that one, uh, continuous integration. So one pain point, pain point uh, pointed out there is the state of the development tree, where we uh, confess that we're not yet in a situation where the MariaDB server tree always passes all tests on all platforms, but we're working on it. So can you comment uh, briefly on that one? Yes, so we used, uh, we used Billboard as our SCI and for the, we have, and we have billboard that works for like for the last maybe 10 years. And for the, and recently we've, in, we are installing, configuring a second billboard, a much newer version on billboard.mariv.org, which is, uh, which and Vlad from MariaDB Foundation are working on. And the goal is to have this one, to use this one in a way that ensures that, well, the tree is always green that things that breaks tests or not compile never gets even pushed into trunk. But we are not there yet. We're just, it's work in progress. Mm -hmm. So every developer, every contributor should be able to uh, rely on the main development branch to work so that the bugs they uh, encounter when developing is theirs only. So when I contribute and I find a bug, it's my bug, not that of somebody else. Any any comment on that? No, besides, yeah, yeah, I agree totally. So there's nothing to comment on that. Good. So so then about something that clearly touches more on the 10.7 preview releases. We say it's difficult to predict when a feature will be ready. Users are always asking for three things that are somewhat mutually exclusive: features by a deadline without bugs. So we will inevitably have to strike some compromise between these three. So what's in your mind the right priority order for features deadline bugs? Well, I wouldn't really want to prioritize, but I also agree with you that we also want features at a right deadline on the right schedule without bugs. But yeah, but actually, but if the feature isn't ready, then, well, it's not ready, we cannot, uh, I cannot just, will it to be ready, it still needs time to be well implemented. So if it's, there's nothing to do about it, if it's not done, it just needs time, that's, that's how it is. And uh, note that a new feature, there might be, I don't know, tens or hundreds or thousands of users waiting for the new feature. But on the other hand, there are, MariaDB has many millions of users and many of them rely on MariaDB being released on a well predictable scheduler. And uh, furthermore, it's, it's snowballing from there because the, if we don't release in time, then it will not get into a specific Linux distribution. And those Linux distributions have may, even more, even many more users will get affected. So that's why we are trying to, well, by making those choices, we're trying to well, make it inconvenient for as few users as possible. So that basically means releasing on schedule. Mm -hmm. So, so the pain point in agreeing uh, whether it's a time-based or feature-based thing, you're saying it is it is uh, time-based. And and there's there's this analogy some people use about the train model that the train leaves the station and uh, meaning a release is done at a certain time, and then the train doesn't wait for individual passengers who who might miss the train. Uh, meaning some features may be missing. So we say that that uh, missing a train is expensive, which sounds like a no-brainer. So why hasn't MariaDB always done that? Or has MariaDB all, all days always done that? No, we started doing that in the last um, six, maybe years. 
So, yeah. so then uh, time-based releases must have some drawbacks. So what are those? Well, uh, if you use a train model and the train leaves a schedule, then you always risk that the train will leave, you know, half full. And if you are particularly unlucky, unlucky it might leave even almost completely empty. This is not good for the company who's running the trains. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. want to sell as many tickets as possible. So then That's why true. don't we have more frequent trains? Can we just not increase the number of train departures? I suppose you will say that has uh, drawbacks too. Yes, because, well, train, the train, they consume some kind of fuel and they are also not cheap to run. And as far in a good going away from train uh, backs to releases, then releasing too often again has its own costs of, there's a cost in doing the release, there's a cost in maintaining the release. So we are trying to balance that. So that then gets us to the, the uh, idea of 10.70 coming as preview releases. So uh, some of those concerns you thought could be solved using preview releases. So let's turn to the thinking from that blog and also from the eight detail blog. So we defined one challenge as making MariaDB mature quicker. So in which way was the experiment with several parallel preview releases of MariaDB server 10.7 um, addressing this challenge of making MariaDB mature quicker? Well, that was, it was actually addressing it on many different levels, but for example, so how we did it before, we had our feature branches that when features already got merged into the trunk, then we released the trunk as MariaDB something alpha version. And then it's over the series of releases it get matured until it gets well production quality. And the risk always is that there's some particularly unlucky, bad designed or buggy feature. And the whole trunk can mature only as fast as the worst feature in the trunk. And so now with the preview, what we did with preview releases, we released a preview binary from every feature branch without merging it into a trunk. And then there were six weeks of internal testing to see how good the feature is and to somehow get a feeling of how fast it'll mature. And only after that, after we were reasonably sure that all the, all the feature, the feature is good enough, then it gets merged into the trunk and then we release it. Together is one or MariaDB binary with all the features. Mm -hmm. So uh, one reason for doing that is that, uh, well, I believe that we uh, there were two reasons for doing that then. What one is the congestion of merge hustle happening just before the release. That's an internal thing. Uh, but then you also mentioned this uh, preventing um, that, that if there's one feature that is not good enough, then it's like the, the one bad apple is not uh, contaminating, forcing the whole basket to, to rot. Uh, and that would then mean that such features would not make it into the first normal merged release 10.7.1. Was that the idea? Yes, and this has actually happened. One of the features that you mentioned earlier, it did not make into the release because it didn't, well, it didn't pass the quality checks and which actually proves, which it's said and uh, in a sense, but also it shows that we are serious about the quality. And if the feature, even if you has shown the features a preview release, but it didn't, uh, make the quality check, then we do not add it to my ADB and so on. So then it, uh, one it has the new chance whenever 10.8 uh, will happen, I suppose. Yes, it's if it will get to a uh, minimum re required stability level, maturity level, then it will get into the next release. Mm -hmm. And 10.7.1 uh, has appeared as well. And it was, if I remember correctly, declared release candidate, RC. Uh, now, what was the logic behind, behind that, such an early release with, with uh, such a, a mature term? Yes, because we skipped alphas 
and we did preview releases they went out with basically alpha quality although as later testing has shown they were much many of them were better than alpha and then we've spent uh, six weeks for every feature on internal testing and we found and fixed uh, no less than 50 bugs in all those features before adding them to the trunk which was pretty much equivalent to what we had before on all those life cycles from alpha to beta and over to RC. So that's why the features that were added to the trunk and to the RC actually, they were much better than we usually push into the trunk, much more stable, much more mature because of this not uh, random testing in the wild, but actually targeted, targeted testing per feature. And those bugs that we found, there are bugs that were ne never present in any of the releases, the bugs that none of our users will ever have to face. And the result, we thought that the server is mature enough to be, well, close to what we could release as production. That's why it's called release candidate, because it was a candidate for the release eventually. OK, so so I think that's that's the logic behind 10.7.0 and 10.7.1. So it seems like you're quite happy about how the experiment worked out. Is, is, that, is that the case? Yes, I think, in my opinion, it went pretty well. Lots of bugs were found. Uh, features were not got pushed were much better than well, in previous MariaDB releases uh, that got pushed merged into the trunk, they all got go to the same, they all got to be production quality by the time of the J release. But this time, but this time we can get to J much sooner because of this restructuring of efforts. And so yes, I think it was working pretty well. Excellent. That's that's good news. So, anything else you you wish to highlight on ten point seven? I mean, what's your favorite feature in ten point seven? Or do you have one? Mm, well, of course, for me as a developer, favorite features would be features I was personally involved in. I think the one that I like the most is it's not very visible to users, but it's the one with provider plugins, because we always had this, say, dilemma. So we had a numerous uh, compression algorithms inside the server for InnoDB, for, well, earlier in, for TokyoDB as well, for Marunga, and for RocksDB. And the problem is that pretty much no user in the world, or almost no user, would need to use all of them. But on the other hand, there are definitely users who use every single one of them. So we cannot remove any of them because some users will, will be affected, but no user needs all of them. But on the other hand, because of this, because we have to ship them all, every user will need to install all the libraries for all the compression algorithms one will never ever use. And this is pretty much sounds like an unsolved problem, unsolvable problem. And in 10.7, we have solved it. That's what I like about solving and that's a good story problem. and that's a good solving reason why it's problem. yes. No, I was just saying that solving and it's a good reason problem for it to be nice. your favorite or favorite uh, feature. It's not just because you yourself were were involved. So that's the good one. Hey, uh, anything more you you wish uh, us to say on ten point seven or the release model? No, wait for the next release. We hope it will be good enough to be great. Excellent. Well, thanks a lot, Sergei Golovchik, for this. Thank you. So thank you, Sergei Golovchik, for that. I managed to still get hold of my boss, the chairman, Eric Horman, and uh, we're down, down here for a discussion about what the MariaDB Foundation plans to do 
next year, 2022. So Eric, how do you think that this Friends episode went with our commenting? Uh, I think it's great that we're experimenting with uh, how to work in a world where we're doing more online. I'm going to guess that some of them are going to work and others are not going to work as well. And we're going to learn something in the process. So my suspicion is that uh, this is a first iteration and uh, some of it will be fun. Some of it will be rough, but I think it'll, I think it'll be good. I, I will learn. We will learn. And I think we were commenting a bit too much. I think we will have to shorten it in, in the future, but I think that the concept of such might work. And I'm looking forward to the feedback from from our uh, community. Yeah. What we're here to do now is, is to take a look at our uh, current draft of the aspirational goals uh, for 2022, yeah. which we have in our respective hands, and this might or might not be published. We haven't really made up on our, our minds on, well, on, on that. It's a draft. It so. is a draft. <laughs> yeah. And, and some of it was initiated by you, some of it uh, was things that I have thought of for a long time, and we also got external input here mm -hmm. so so i think we should have a discussion about what these these uh, aspirational goals are and can you you were the uh, father of the term aspirational goals so what, what do you mean by aspirational so i uh, i wanted to get us talking and thinking about uh what we could achieve if we had not just the resources that we have today but if also more resources Arrive. So, so I wanted us to think about things that were not so far into the future that they were, oh, this is a dream of 10 years from now, but things that would, some of these things probably aren't really achievable in 2022 because they would require uh, more, uh, more funding for that, but they're things that, that, that we really could make meaningful progress on. Um, maybe even with the funding that, that exists today, but certainly if, if more were there, and and to get us thinking about uh, how we can advance the mission more, and and what we, what would that actually look like in terms of of things that we should be working on. And I like that very much. And I think what uh, what it makes possible is is a certain level of creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, anybody who's being held accountable for all their goals will be a bit sandbagging and, and cautious of, exactly. and not, not, not be too creative about what could perhaps be done. And I, I also, from as the CEO, I, I felt free to write stuff that I think would be great to have uh, without then uh, at the end of the year hearing, so Kai, how did you do on, on goal A1.4? Mm -hmm. Can you explain? Yeah, yeah. So, so let's then move on, on to this. They are separated into three areas, openness, adoption, and continuity. And it, those are the three words that, that we have used to abstract our, our mission. But they are the sort of not inventions by you or me. They, they, they have been there all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've just used them as, as, as coat hangers for, for, for concepts. Yeah. And within openness, the, the, uh, the first one, is a complex of, of a number of issues around the foundation staff to act as contribution process role models. And that, that's something that uh, we've been discussing a long while, but, but you've been a, a prime initiator of it. And let me try to represent how I believe uh, that you want this, this process to be uh, improved, and then you can correct me. So. So one key here is to mature the code commit process so that internally we behave as we expect externally our contributors to, 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 to behave. And, and perhaps that to be a role model for others, so uh, uh, such as the, the, the corporation, at least as a test bed for whether the ADB corporation wants to follow the same GitHub pull request steps as any outside contributor would do, and the same with the review process. So, so any comment on that? Um, uh, yeah, sure. So I think that uh, one of the things that, that uh, if, if you uh, uh, follow your own process, uh, you get first-hand experience with what are the parts of it that are rough, what are the parts of it that, that need improvement. And so, uh, so by actually being a, a user of the process, uh, then uh, we will, 
better understand what we're asking uh, people to do that, that are not in the foundation, um, that don't have commit rights directly to, to the GitHub repository. Um, so we'll be able to improve that experience for uh, for all contributors. So we're eating our own dog food on, on, on that. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and, and I think that that, that process uh, will almost certainly cause um, uh, a little bit of rethinking on uh, on how, how should we be doing this? Should we be doing more of something or less of something? And, uh, and I expect that probably the first thing we'll see is the, uh, the, the template will probably get um, a uh, head scratch, something, something uh, uh, more thought about with that. Uh, and I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying that by looking at it every time, uh, that people will have ideas and, and that will be the first natural place that we'll, that we'll see that. So one idea that, that I got here is that uh, there's of course internal resistance to this. If, if this had been a no-brainer, we would have followed the process internally all the time. And, and, and one type of resistance is that, well, GitHub pull requests, they are for asynchronous communication. But since we are in, in the same organization within the foundation, it's so much quicker if we just have a video conference or happen to be in the same place like Vicenzo and Monti are, are here today and, and, and that face to face process uh, is so different yeah, from, from, from yeah. a pull request. So uh, how any comment on that? Right. So so I think that that uh, it, it would be unreasonable to expect that that everybody would a hundred percent move to that right away. I don't think that's I don't think that that's likely. But also I think that um, if if I happen to to uh, have have a pull request open, and maybe I, I get guidance from you over Zulip, or maybe a, a, a Jitsi call, or whatever video conference call. Um, that the the extra burden of me summarizing that in a few sentences on the uh, uh, on, on the open pull request hopefully isn't too high of a burden. But I think I think we learn about that. Uh, and this is really about about learning. So yeah. So true. yeah. So externally, we have a goal of increasing the number of contributions, uh, maturing the external contribution process, meaning we now have a certain number of open pull requests. It was a while ago, it was 92, and we've put some effort into it. It's now, I believe, 79. Yes. Uh, and uh, lowering that number is, yeah. I think, a fair goal. Right. And I think that also uh, uh, something that may not be well understood, and it certainly isn't well understood by me in that number, is how many are open, but uh, the the request is waiting on the original contributor compared to uh, how many are open and waiting on review from a subject matter expert that hasn't been able to, to take the time yet. And so, uh, so I don't want to drive just towards pulling that number to zero, uh, I, I want to make sure that that we are uh, looking at each of them and and giving each the appropriate care, which may not be to close it. It may be to invite another round of work. Mm -hmm. So let's move to adoption, and 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 here our goal is to expand the outreach into user uh, communities. Now here comes my first pet idea. Uh, uh, and I'm excited about it, and, and I'm, I want to share the excitement with those who, who, who watch our video, but I want your comment. And so, uh, create human language specific landing pages and video versions of them in 10 languages. So, would have mariadb.org slash ru for Russian and uh, fr for French and de for German. And we've listed a number of languages here. Chinese, Japanese, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, Swedish, Finnish. That's just a working list. And it's 10 of them. And that would have the top level information on MariaDB server. Like if you want to read about MariaDB server on one page, because you need to convince somebody else that we should use MariaDB for this, then it's going to have a bigger impact if it is in your own language. And if there's an accompanying video on it. And, and I'm excited about this, but what about you? Yeah, well, so what I like about it is that uh, in terms of adoption, it, it opens the door for a first-level read 
uh, or a first level view if it's video uh, from from somebody that might be considering the product in a way that is easier than if they have to uh, read or listen in uh, something that is a language that they're not uh, uh, comfortable in. And so uh, I think that's that's really quite nice. And another thing I like about it is that it happens to be measurable. We will be able to to get some insight into how much that's being uh, how, how often these pages are being loaded, how many different uh, people are coming to see them, and that will give us guidance to how much more does it make sense to, to do. Is it just the landing pages, or do we need to really think about investing in more languages, in deeper content into the site? Um, and, and I think that, that we can make those decisions based on data that we're collecting. We will get objective data, and, mm -hmm. and I think in IT everybody thinks that, well, everybody knows English anyway, but we know from our videos that uh, content producers that are really knowledgeable in MariaDB uh, need subtitles sometimes even more than I do. Uh, I'm not a native speaker, and, and, and I think us non-native English speakers are in a majority, and, and we have several levels of, of uh, uh, comfortability with, with, with English. Mm -hmm. So moving on then on these land, uh, landing pages, there's uh, two other ideas on, on, on landing pages and they are specifically in English and as you say, uh, if we get objective data that language versions are, are interesting and, and specific landing pages in English are, are important, we might extend it, but that's not amongst our even aspirational goals yet. So one would be programming language specific English landing pages with uh, dash Python or, or dash uh, Perl or whatever language. We haven't listed that. I did list the, the 10 human languages. And that would contain the basic information that is relevant if you're coming from a Python environment. Mm -hmm. The videos and the, the, the uh, um, connectors and the articles and, and, and all of that. And, and hopefully the the um, the get up and running quickly and easily, showing how you can use this and that uh, my hope would be that that uh, it would make experimenting for the first time uh, super easy, that you can just docker up some stuff and then away you go or similar, uh, but something that's, that's very easy to follow, uh, follow along with and see, no problem, I write this Python program and here I have Hello world from the database. Mm -hmm. You were slightly less, uh, to put it mildly, impressed by the idea that we would do a similar type of, of landing pages for people considering should I use product A or uh, should I use, use MariaDB, like a comparison page between MySQL or Mongo or, or Postgres. Yeah. Now, why are you less impressed or less <laughs> eager about that? Well, I, I think. Uh, first off, uh, uh, the uh, the ability to be objective is is really really hard there. So so uh, even even knowing and being fully disclosed that yes, we're we're biased in favor of of our uh, of our own approach of our own solution. Um, uh, it I think it would be really really hard to provide uh, an objective um, thing that uh, that that even even the, the 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 other product, even FooDB, that the the people from FooDB would say, oh yeah, that's fair. Well, I, I don't uh, want the FooDB. That my central goal is not the uh, the FooDB zealots to to think, oh, that's really great. Uh, um, uh, I would rather want uh, people thinking about FooDB and and uh, MariaDB to, right. to get some pointers relevant to their conundrum of should I pick Foo or, or, or Maria DB, but I, I, I have given up, I will not convince you here uh, dur during this, this presentation, I, I will perhaps make an experiment with some, sure. some Foo DB and let's see if you change your mind. Yeah, absolutely, I think that's the way to do it, is that let, let's, let's, see, let's see one example and see if, uh, if, if it is done in the way that, that is, uh, that's honorable, it's not trash talking, which I know is not the intent, uh, but, but see that it, it would be perceived uh, uh, well. And, and, and I think once we have an example to, work, to look at and work from, uh, we can think about, is this something that, that we want to uh, invest more in? 
I do think that there are many cases where Maria is better than Foodie, but I have to confess, con con uh, uh, confess that Foodie can can be better in some circumstances. <laughs> yes, exactly. So uh, then another goal that we have is is to establish a new model for the hybrid world we, we, of, of, of online and face-to-face. -face. So you never know exactly how the pandemic will, will uh, continue, but I do think that, that people are longing for face-to-face for -face, uh, meetings like we are having now um, and sharing, we're not sharing beer, we're sharing, sharing water, at least today, uh, and, and uh, there also will be people who don't want to travel. I mean, we've, we've seen the benefit of not having to stand in a queue and not having to uh, pollute the, 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 the climate. And, and uh, we've, we also want to pick races, like instead of going to one conference uh, and spend uh, all of your energy on that one, you, you can go to five conferences and just pick the races. So there are benefits to both. And I think we have to find a solution where where you can get the best of both worlds, both as a as a presenter and and as above all as a, as a participant. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think that the uh, that what we've seen so far, we've already learned some things about what what works in online and some of the things that are challenging in online. So so we're we're already seeing some experience there that is uh, shaping the thinking. Um, and also we have, uh, I, we don't have to only look inward. We can look to see, uh, a, a FOSDEM, I think is a, is a great, uh, uh, place to look for, uh, things that have worked and things that have not. Um, and, and so I think there is, a, a real sense and real value in, in trying to continue to experiment with bridging the, the hybrid in-person distance, uh, in-person world, um, uh, and also the, the online world. So mm -hmm. I think, I think if we can work on that, um, uh, that, that will pay off. Uh, we're also trying to identify, uh, the best ways of, of doing developer adoption. So like the landing pages is one of them, uh, improving the documentation. I think that's, that's something where we would want as in, in an aspirational way, put more resources on on uh, good infrastructure for 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 the knowledge base and good uh, more, more more content. And and uh, there's research out there about how MariaDB is is being used. We haven't yet drawn the conclusions for, from from that to say uh, identified exactly how how to uh, how, how the Stack Overflow research, for instance, what it means for our adoption. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, since those numbers are out there, uh, uh, they should at least be looked at and considered. Uh, popularity contests maybe aren't the best ways to measure all things, but it's good data to at least look at. Absolutely. So uh, we had um, openness, we had adoption, and the third and last is is, is continuity. So uh, within this continuity, uh, there's there's several goals that are probably a bit boring because they're internal to, to, to us in, in how to create uh, uh, the, the prerequisites for, for executing a long way into to have a, a thriving ecosystem mm -hmm. into, into the future. But one that's probably interesting for our viewers is to cultivate tomorrow's developers. So, Absolutely. And uh, what would be some ideas there? I mean, Google Summer of Code, unconferences, meeting again physically, I, I really miss that we haven't had uh, a, a real developer meeting uh, where uh, not only do we have all the developers from the MariaDB Corporation showing up as well as the foundation staff, but we get developers from some of the major contributors showing up as well, uh, and we get all the people in a room, and oh, things that come out of that are like instant ad column, which... which, which really came out of a discussion in one of those developer meetings. So, uh, and, and I, I want the opportunity to have those open uh, uh, conversations I, and, uh, and share each other's notions about what things we want to see change in the code base over time. And, uh, and this is going to be a tough one to do given travel and travel restrictions and such, 
so I think this is another area where we're going to have to learn how to do this in a hybrid fashion. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I have a, a confession to make, uh, at least towards, towards you, you whom, uh, whom I've been talking about the Meridivi University program for ages. And what has happened? Well, not much. <laughs> uh, so, so, on that one, it's still an aspirational goal. And the, the issue here is, uh, people, at, so, so the, the idea with the university program is for us to uh, be the aggregator of classes around database tuition with Maria Divi as an example. And, and it could very well be training materials for usage also outside universities. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the resources to develop them from scratch. Right. And what I've learned now is that that doesn't happen automatically uh, in such a way that, that we would ask University X to provide their classes and then uh, create a snowball on top of it. Uh, but we have some uh, some ideas on on how this snow initial snowball could could, could mm -hmm. happen. So don't give up on that one. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think uh, indeed the uh, getting getting the university program going is directly adjacent to cultivating tomorrow's developers, and it, it can start with cultivate cultivating tomorrow's users. Yes. But uh, but. That's, that's, of course, uh, the large set. And from that large set, we get the next set in. Those are the people that are going to find reasons and ways to contribute. And ultimately, the next generation of developers uh, is a group we want to cultivate as well. And for the next generation of, of uh, developers to, to have a place to live, we need to do something about the, the, the carbon imprint. The, the, the... Um. The climate catastrophe, and and uh, here I think that I mean this is something that that is truly exciting uh, from my perspective for, for next year to to look at in which way Maria DB is is uh, relevant to 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 the climate, and and the reason why I find it exciting is that there's no clear answer to it. It's it's something that. Uh, I'm sure that IT has one of the largest impacts on the climate and lots of IT is database and lots of databases Maria did. So we do have an impact. But it's not clear how we impact this. So should we optimize to become even more faster? Or is there other things that we could do? And, and uh, I also have this not invented here hunch from, from, from others that Ah, so you're now trying to greenwash yourself and, 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 and trying to portray Maria DB as, as a, a, as a climate friendly database and not do anything about it. Uh, because there's this logic that, of course, Maria DB is, is a performant database. And, and if, if you get more transactions per second, you probably get more transactions per, per carbon dioc dioxide. So, um, I want to make sure that this is not a marketing thing where we, uh, show ourselves as, as being uh, holier than thou. But I also am afraid of, or not afraid of, uh, absolutely not afraid, I'm even looking forward to those discussions because they are interesting. But I, I am expecting some resistance uh, from the opposite side saying, well, hey, we're a database and we're about performance and transactions and efficiency. It's none of our business, the, 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 the climate side. Uh, uh, you are striving to be overly politically correct if, if you want to sensitize uh, people to, to climate in the context of Maria Davis. So what's your take on that? Well, so, so first off, absolutely, the um, uh, I don't want to see anything that looks like market greenwashing. Um, I, but let's, let's talk about what we can see. Um, uh, I have a t-shirt, I didn't wear it today, I wish I did. Um, I have a t-shirt, uh, which uh, I got a few years ago, that has, uh, I, uh, it says, some like it hot, it has a competitor's database uh, overheating, and it, it has a, uh, a, a, um, uh, a Marie DB uh, mascot keeping cool, uh, implying that, uh, that, that their servers are running cooler if they're running uh, 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 Marine TV and and uh, and that was really about efficiency and 
and we didn't see a, a, a giant backlash to that, of course. And when I was working with uh, a very large e-commerce site, when we talked about space in the data center, we didn't mean physical space in the racks. What we meant was power consumption. And so we were saying this rack already has too many pizza boxes in it. We can't put any more in, not because there wasn't physical space, but because we couldn't get power to them. So the more we can do to reduce the power consumption footprint of these, these, uh, these servers that are out there, the more, the more we can process data, the savings is going to come to the large uh, deployments. And so I think there's a real direct financial reason to prefer a database which is able to do more with less electrical power. Which in turn connects to the CO2 problems. So I don't think that we can conclude with any other continuity uh, aspirational goals that would be more important than that. So um, I'm happy with this. Any, any final words to conclude from your side? Uh, no, but uh, I, I do want to say thank you uh, for, for uh, doing this new, new effort of trying to draft aspirational goals as opposed to just the safe goals that we know we can hit. Um, and, uh, and I look forward to seeing how this draft evolves a little bit and what the impact is on the, uh, on the actual execution of the foundation in 2022. Well, thanks, Eric, for, for igniting this being the impulse to, to, to get it done and for your contributions to it. So thank you. Absolutely. Hey, that was good. That was good. That was fun. <laughs> See, we can have fun. Yeah, we can have fun. And, and also, it's, I don't think that there was any, I mean, this was not, I think it was valuable. And, and, and it was uh, almost effortless yeah. because we, we uh, walked through it once beforehand. And mm -hmm. so there wasn't this giant amount of preparations to get mm -hmm. it well done. Mm -hmm. The giant amount of preparations was all the work that we put into this mm -hmm. and, and then we just aired it. And, and then what was part of my thinking was that it couldn't be an interview. And this was not an interview. No. It was the first time that, that we've had a conversation in one of these mm -hmm. manifests. And I think Yeah let's see how let's see let's see how it lands with the uh with the with the people. Yeah. Yeah yeah. yeah. Good. So we can feel the rest then. Yeah. <sighs>So that was the chat with Eric and that also concludes the server mini fest from the front lines and we now did of course a bit of an experiment with a new format. We already heard from you that you don't dislike monologues so we substituted that with dialogues and interviews but now we interspersed these dialogues and interviews also with commentaries from the audience. This was an experiment like uh, Eric put it. We'd like to hear what you think about it, so give your comments, please. And thank you for attending the Maria DB Server Minifest December 2021 edition. Bye.